الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah The Quran a message to all of humankind is within the context of Islam being the religion of all humankind because the basic premise from which Islam operates is that as there is only one God and one human race and God revealed only one religion so as not to confuse human beings and he sent one line of prophethood to convey that message and as such the message of all of the prophets was one single message the last in the line of those prophets was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and for him to be the last it meant on one hand that he was sent not to particular people and places as the earlier prophets had been sent prophets who were sent to India to China to Africa to Europe to America they were sent to their own people in particular areas of the world because of the fact that others would come after them to continue that message however when prophethood came to an end with Muhammad ibn Abdullah that final prophet was a prophet sent not to a particular people in a particular place for a particular period of time but a prophet sent to all of humankind and this is not an empty claim dreamed up by Muslims later on after his time Allah describes him as a mercy unto all of humankind in the Quran itself in the book of Revelation which he brought he is described as a prophet sent to all of humankind and to underscore that fact as it might be debated in our times 1400 years after the time of the last prophet a miracle was left a miracle left that humankind would know through it the final message and know that what was taught by the final messenger was a message for all of humankind all prophets were given miracles which would convince their people that they were prophets of Allah Prophet Muhammad may God's peace and blessing be upon him had said in a well-known hadith or statement of his which is recorded authentically all prophets were given something which would cause people to believe in them what I was given is none other than a revelation the Quran which was revealed to me all prophets were given these miracles however because of the fact that they were prophets for a limited period of time their miracles were limited to those periods of time 
Because if we take, for example, among the last of the prophets, the more recent prophets, Moses, the prophet to the Jews, his main miracle, as recorded and described in the books of the Torah, as well as in the Quran itself, his miracle was that of being able to turn his staff into a snake. The type of miracle which may be associated with magic. Because in his time, magicians held a special place in society in ancient Egypt among the special positions in the court of the rulers, the pharaohs, was magicians. People feared them. People admired them. People were amazed by them. So, Allah sent with Prophet Moses a miracle similar to the types of miracles which the uh, magicians appeared to do except for the fact that his was real. Theirs was illusion. People thought that what they threw on the ground became snakes, writhing in front of them. But when Prophet Musa السلام, threw his staff, his became a snake which ate up the others indicating that what he had, what he brought, was superior to what they had. That the people could see. For the magicians who knew what they were doing, knew that what they were doing was only illusion. Fooling people. When they saw the staff of Moses become a snake and eat theirs, they knew this man must be a man of God. And that is why they fell down in prostration. Immediately. They didn't have to think twice. Because all that they did, did not involve changing the nature of sticks and ropes. It was only illusion. Whereas in the case of Prophet Moses, his staff became a snake. So Prophet Moses was given a miracle similar to the magic of the magicians, but greater. If we look after him to Prophet Jesus, Jesus again sent to the Jews, the last of the prophets sent specifically to the Jews. He was sent to a people who at that time were the masters of medicine. And actually even until this time, Jews remain leaders in the field of medicine. They could produce medicines which would cure eye diseases. They knew how to make splints which would heal broken limbs people who were sick with fever appearing about to die they could cure them through their medicines and they would be healthy again so prophet jesus was sent with miracles in those same areas except that what he brought was above superior to what they had so he was able to make the blind see not just those who became blind but those who were born blind he was able to make the lame walk people who were born crippled he was able to make them walk by the power of God. 
And furthermore, he was able to make the dead come back to life. A miracle from God. For the Jewish doctors, they knew this man must be from God. Because what he was doing was beyond anything they could imagine in the field of healing. However, if someone were to ask us today to show us the staff of Moses, which became a snake, where is it? In a museum? Somewhere? No. Or the Red Sea, where he hit it and it parted to demonstrate it to us, to show us where that took place, cannot be shown. Because his miracles were for his own time. Same thing with Prophet Jesus. The man who Jesus brought back to life, is he around today so we can say here he is? Lazarus according to the Bible. Alive, had been dead? No, we don't have him. Or any of those who were made to see? Or the other miracles of Jesus? Whether recorded in the Gospels or in the Quran? There's a miracle of Jesus recorded in the Quran not found in the Gospels or any of the common Gospels known today. It is found in some of the ancient and lost Gospels. Where he gathered clay, molded it into the shape of a bird, blew on it, and it flew away a living bird. Do we have that bird? No. So the miracles of Prophet Jesus were limited to his time. So if Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, was to be a messenger sent to all of humankind till the end of the world, then he had to have a miracle which would not only win over the hearts of the people of his time, but one which would stand as evidence for people until the last day of this world. So if somebody said, where is the miracle of Muhammad? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We can say, here is his miracle. Here it is. And that is the Quran. Preserved because it is a message to all of humankind. So it had to be preserved. This was a necessity. So Allah, on one hand, chose an area in which his people, the original people to whom he was sent, who would then carry the message to the rest of the world, he chose an area which these people admired, loved, worshipped and that was in literary eloquence the Arabs loved literature so much so that their most popular odes were written in gold tablets and hung on the Kaaba the place central place of their worship and they would have contests yearly gathering in places like Taif where they would compete with each other in prose and poetry. They loved it. They didn't have medicine. They were not known for magicians. They didn't have structures built, a built civilization. But they did love literature. So Allah gave Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a miracle 
in the field of literature a book written with the same letters that they wrote spoken with the same vowels and consonants that they spoke but a book which was inimitable which they could not imitate a book whose magic was beyond their abilities a book which captured their hearts their response to it was that it had to be some form of magic why they couldn't make one like it and why it seemed to just captivate them that literary miracle was a miracle with a built-in challenge you find in the Quran in Surah Al-Isra the 17th chapter verse 88 where Allah says there a challenge to the people to whom the Prophet Sallallahu was first sent and ultimately to humankind say if humankind and the jinn the invisible world creatures from the invisible world gathered together to produce a scripture like this Quran they would not be able even if they helped each other this was the challenge produce a book like this one then that challenge was reduced reduced from a whole book to only 10 chapters and that can be found in the 11th chapter verse 13 wherein Allah says there or they say he has made it up in reference to the Quran say to them create then bring for us ten chapters like it which are invented and call whoever you wish to help you besides Allah if you are truthful if your accusation that he made it up himself is true then do something similar produce ten chapters not the whole book anymore ten chapters from the book similar then that challenge was reduced to one chapter in the 10th chapter of the Quran verse 38 or they say he has made it up say to them then bring a single chapter like it and call on whoever you wish for help besides Allah if you are truthful and that challenge was repeated again a final time twice now in the Quran Surah Al-Baqarah verse 23 وَإِنْكُنْتُمْ If you are in doubt about what I have revealed to my slave then bring a single chapter like it and call your witnesses besides Allah if you are indeed truthful this was the challenge of course for the average person who reads the Quran he or she reads it in translation so they may not find it to be miraculous if one reads in English the translation of the smallest chapter in the Quran قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ or إِنَّا أَطَيْنَا كَلْكَوْثَرْ three verses if one reads the translation in the best of translations 
one would still feel in the end, I'm sure Shakespeare or Wordsworth or somebody like that of the great poets of the past, English poets, they could have written something more eloquent. So where is the miracle? Furthermore, when the dowry is to be given, and it's not the amount that was agreed upon, or the young man decides he wants more, and the girl cannot provide the amount, her family doesn't have the means, so what does the family do? Then her husband and his mother catch her in the kitchen, pour kerosene over her, and set her on fire. Bride burning, a great evil. Though something in Islamic law, such act, is deserving of the death penalty. As honor killing is deserving of the death penalty. But unfortunately, Muslims don't judge by the book of Allah today. And they avoid reflecting on its meanings. In the time of the Prophet, May God's peace and blessing be upon him. His companions used to say, we used to read the Quran 10 verses at a time. And we wouldn't go on to another 10 until we understood what God was saying to us. And we tried to implement it in our lives. So they reflected on the Quran. And Allah said in Surah Muhammad verse 24, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Will they not reflect on the meanings of the Quran or are their hearts locked up? This is the state of the Muslim Ummah today. Hearts locked up. Not reflecting on the meanings. Nor do they use it as a cure. And Allah describes the Quran as a cure. Shifa'un lima fi sudur. A cure for whatever is in the hearts. Get close to God, understand the commandments of God, and the diseases of the heart will be cured. So Muslims, unfortunately, in spite of the fact that this was the universal message, message to all of humankind, and those who have accepted that message, or supposed to have accepted that message, unfortunately, they are not acting on it today. And this is the challenge which faces the Muslim world today. To go back to the Quran and to bring that message to humankind back to life. To make it the core, the basic source of guidance. Determining how they live their lives, how they relate to their wives, how do they relate to their children, their communities, bringing that Quran alive. This is the challenge. The Quran, a message to all of humankind. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah, Dr. Abu Abina Bilal Phillips, for your very elucidative and a very insightful talk on the subject of the day, the Quran, a message to mankind. Now we would have the more interesting question and answer session. And uh, Dr. Bilal is one of the very erudite and well informed and well versed one of the most eminent speakers in English on Islam in the world today and we are fortunate to have him here at the 10-day international conference. You may put forward your question to Dr. Bilal on the topic, the Quran, a message to mankind. It should be brief and to the point. You may ask only one question at a time, even if you have more than one question. Put the priority wise question ahead. Non Muslim brothers and sisters would be given preference to ask their questions first, and then only uh, Muslim brothers and sisters would be given preference. 
questions on slips I am sure would not be given a chance but seeing the number of people already lining up at the mics and that we have to finish at 10 p.m. Kindly state your name and profession so that Dr. Bilal Phillips can give you a more appropriate response and understand your question in better educational context. May we again allow the first question from the sister's side. We'll have one question from the sister's side as we had earlier and two questions from the brother's side. Again a question from the sister's side and so on and so forth. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ashraf, self-employed. Is it okay to make dawa in our own style except the style or the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam or which is ordered according to Quran? I mean like the best of word is word of Allah and the best of way of life is the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Except this, is there any way or is that okay to make dawa to people who are not in the right path? Okay, the question as to methods of calling people or explaining to people Islam. Whether these methods are limited to those employed by the Prophet. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. Or whether we can use other methods as in our time. The internet wasn't around 1,400 years ago. So the Prophet didn't use the internet. So do we say then, since the Prophet did what he was commanded by Quran, that we cannot use the internet as a means to convey the message of Islam to others? No. We don't look at it in that limited sense. What we look at is that the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, used whatever means were available to him to convey that message. Whatever means which didn't involve haram, he utilized them, whatever was available at his time. So therefore, if there are other means which become possible now, the telephone, the television, the internet, these other various forms of media, then we utilize it. The Prophet in his day, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, when he wanted to convey the message to his people, he climbed up on top of a mountain, called the people, the people gathered, this was his means of media communication. On top of the mountain, everybody could see him and he could say the message to everybody. That's the best that he could do at that time. Now we have a television which will broadcast it across the world. We don't question, well, the Prophet ﷺ didn't use television, so therefore we shouldn't use television today. So, what we do is utilize whatever media means are available to us. However, where we find principles, not media, but principles wherein people try to convey the message in a way which contradicts the way of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, here is now when we say, no, we don't want to use that method because it is not keeping with the method of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So for example, if it was suggested to us, in order to win over the hearts of some of the people in our community, we go to their temple, right? And participate in their acts of worship in order to get closer to them and to build friendship so that they may come into our place of worship and learn about the message we say, no, that method is not acceptable. And so on and so forth. Yes, brother. Uh, good evening. 
my name is Yashwant Rao. I'm a businessman. I want to ask you one question. I understand that the Quran is a way to reach heaven. I'm not sure whether I'm right or wrong. That is what is my interpretation. If it is correct, then what happens to people who don't have exposure or ability to understand Quran? Like uh, what happens to some tribals living in deep forest where they have no means to reach Quran? What is their fate? Okay, reading of the Quran, understanding its message, and living in accordance with its message is a way to paradise. No doubt. However, it doesn't mean that those who didn't read the Quran cannot go to paradise. We have examples even from the Prophet's life where one of the people who accepted Islam accepted it before a battle, joined in the battle and died without ever reading anything from the Quran. He didn't make a single prayer. And the Prophet said that he would be among the people of paradise. So the fundamental key to paradise is the acceptance of God in one's life, the true God, and to commit oneself to worship Him alone. That is the main key. The Quran explains that key in detail and how to apply it throughout your life. And God has sent messages to human beings throughout the world. Those who didn't receive the message in its pure form or with sufficient clarity to be able to accept it, then God does not hold them to account because He is the one who destined how and in what circumstances they were born. And as Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, explained to us in some of his statements that those people to whom the message didn't reach, they're known as Ahlul Fatra. Ahlul Fatra. The people who were in a state where the message didn't reach them. Such people prior to the final judgment will be brought back and a messenger will be sent to them from God and they will be commanded to believe in God and to obey the messenger and those who obey him will then go on to paradise those who do not will go on to hell yes sister Assalamu alaikum. My name is Zubi Siddiqui. I'm a dental student. Uh, brother, I'd like to ask you that uh, the Quran, in spite of being so advanced and compatible with science or whatever, in spite of it being like that, why is it that the Ummah has distanced itself from it? The reason why Muslims no longer read the Qur'an as it should be read, has historical origins. We have a legacy. In the early generations when Islam spread out of Arabia, people learned the Arabic language and the Qur'an was read and understood. However, in time, when colonial powers entered into the Muslim world and subjugated Muslim countries, the process of their languages evolving into Arabic was stopped. So generations were raised who did not know Arabic. It came to be the language known only to the priest class, the Maulanas and the Molvis. They're the only ones who knew it. And that's why a need arose for translation. And those Maulanas and Mulvis were opposed to the translation. They had vested interests, etc. Or in ignorance, not understanding that the understanding of the message was critical. So, translations appeared. And people had an opportunity to read it more and to understand it more. But, 
in spite of those translations for most Muslims they are still living the legacy of that earlier period where Muslims didn't know Arabic and didn't know what the Quran said and in that period of time the reading of the Quran for Barakah for the blessing of reading it became such a standard a standard custom that it requires generations to break people have to be educated they have to understand that this way this inheritance this legacy of the past is an evil legacy it wasn't good and it needs to be changed we need to go back and learn the Arabic language make it a part of our educational systems and at the same time spread the translations make it well known make sure that our children who are growing up understand the Quran that they read whether in Ramadan or outside of Ramadan yes brother Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh my name is Irfan from Hyderabad my parents were non-muslims and they believe on Lord Allah but they won't accept the Islam on behalf of wrongdoing Muslims is there any solution for my parents to accept Islam because I don't want to see him the hell tomorrow welcome to Islam first and foremost welcome to Islam secondly you have to be patient you have to be patient how long ago did you accept Islam? Two years. Two years ago. Let me tell you that my parents took 21 years to accept Islam. If I were to have given up on them after two years, that would have been injustice. So what you have to be first and foremost is patient and continue to convey the message and be the best example of that message. When they see Islam in your life, how it has changed you, made you a better person, then it will have the impact on them. Yes, sister. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My question is as is said, the Sahaba and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would take 10 ayahs and try to understand them before going to the next 10. So, my question is how did the Sahaba and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? understand the scientific verses of the Quran okay as I explained before maybe you missed that point in my lecture that the scientific points that we are finding out today and with each few years we find out more and more these signs which Allah spoke about were understood in a general sense for example, the description of the development of the embryo that I spoke about. That the people of the time accepted. Allah said it was this way and they said it must have been that way. They didn't have a means to go and check it. They just accepted it. Because believing in God, accepting Allah into our lives means believing in whatever he has informed us. So they accepted it when he said that he sent down iron. They understood it that he gave them iron. It wasn't necessary for them to know that iron didn't exist in the earth until it came from extraterrestrial sources. That didn't need to be known. They dug it up from the earth as they dug up other things. And they accept that it all came from God. So it wasn't a problem. So what happens is that those verses that we speak about, they describe a variety of different natural phenomena in the world. 
Earlier generations, when they saw these verses, they just accepted them and they acted upon them. Similarly, for example, in the Sunnah of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, he instructed people in his time to do certain things which people just did. In our times, we come to find out that they have this benefit, that benefit, or the other benefit. For example, he told his companions not to sleep on their stomachs. He told them not to sleep lying on their stomachs. When he told the companions that, they just gave it up. It might have felt nice, might have been comfortable, but they switched to sleeping on their sides or on their backs. In recent times, in the last 20 years, medical, the medical profession has established on one hand that sleeping on the stomach causes the ailment known as sway back, curvature of the spine where old people walk and they can't straighten them, their backs. It is the main cause. And so they advise people not to sleep on your stomachs. Furthermore, it, sleeping on the stomach has been identified in the UK as the main cause of cot death. Children are put to sleep in at the age of two or three and the parents go back and find them dead not knowing how why when they researched into this they found that one of the most common factors of these children was that they were put to sleep on their stomachs so it was announced back in 1989 front page news doctors warn people away from putting their children to sleep on their stomachs in 1989 by 1997 when they looked at the rate of cot death, they found that it had dropped by nearly 70% from that advice. So the benefit was there. And that's why belief in the Prophet, as belief in Allah, means we accept what he has told us as truth. Similarly, belief in the Prophet means, may God's peace and blessed be upon him, that whatever he has informed us is the whole truth and nothing but the truth.